Coming up, I'll be answering more of your questions from the electronic mailbag. And then new data says that CEOs might be willing to give a raise to people who will come into the office. Let's check it out. Helping you win at work so that you're winning in other areas of your life. I'm Ken. This is the Ken Coleman Show. Thank you for being with us. So we get a lot of questions that come to us as a result of the shows from our viewers and from our listeners. And we like to call it the electronic mailbag. So, Joe, let's open it up. Ken's electronic mail. You've got mail. George writes in, I wanted to ask a question about something you said recently. You took the position that having two full-time remote jobs is unethical. A guy was making 100000 and thought about doubling his income to tackle his debt with another full-time position. I don't feel you made a good point. Why is it unethical? What if someone has an AM serving job and goes to work at another restaurant in the evening? Is that unethical? I can't imagine anyone would say so. No, it is not unethical to do that. If I work a retail job from 8 to 4, and a security job from 5 to 12. Is that unethical? No, it is not, George. You've got me again. Those are both full-time. Some first responders have other full-time jobs, too. In short, I think you let your dislike of remote work spill into an area it doesn't need to. And I don't disagree with your opinion on remote work. Well, George, thank you for pushing back. George, the reason that holding down two full-time remote jobs or hybrid, you're getting hung up on remote. I don't give a crap if it's remote or not, but the only way this is able to be done is remote. Okay, so you're getting hung up, my friend. Here's why it's unethical. I've called it professional polygamy. Do you not understand what that means? If I am married to another woman and Stacy doesn't know about it, that is unethical. Can I keep both marriages going? Good Lord, I don't know how I would, but in this metaphorical example, okay, it's not right. She doesn't know about it. I'm cheating on her. Not to mention it's illegal. So what I'm saying is if you are holding down two full-time jobs, I didn't say you're doing one from 7 p.m. to 2 a.m., That's not the scenario by which I explained it. And you know it, George. Or if you don't know it, now you know it. What I'm saying is if you are uh, working two full-time jobs in the same window, so 40-hour work week or 50, I don't care how you split it, and the other company doesn't know that you're working a full-time job and you're in the same space, we're talking about programmers and people like this doing this. We're not talking about working a side hustle, bussing tables at night. Come on, George. But I like that you push back. I stand by my position. It's professional polygamy. Rebecca's up next. I graduated with my master's degree in therapy. Uh, Excuse me. Art therapy. Master's degree in art therapy two years ago. I love connecting one-on-one with people, but I can quickly become burned out by the levels of emotional drainage I'm feeling, working primarily with traumatized children. I was getting paid $36,000 a year, which I was told was very good for the field. I quit and stopped working in mental health. I now feel so guilty about getting that education that my parents paid for, but not working in the field. But I don't want to hate my job. I've been trying to do some private art teaching, which I love, but I'm only making $700 a month doing this so I can supplement by cleaning jobs. I feel like I'm wasting my education uh, and some of my skill set. Was it a bad decision to leave the field? No, it was not a bad decision. If nothing else... If it was a temporary move, it was the right thing because you were burned out. So one of the most underrated actions of successful people is stepping back or slowing down. It seems counterproductive. It seems negative, like I'm lazy or I'm wasting this education my parents paid for. I love that you shared this, Rebecca. Very real. Um, but stepping back or slowing down is one of the great tactics of successful people. You got to know when to slow down, when to step away or step back. You stepped away. I think it's a good move at the time. Um, if you cannot get to a place where you can regulate your 
thoughts and feelings in what is a very intense job. These are these are young children who have been traumatized. This is heavy duty stuff you're seeing and hearing and attempting to deal with. And it takes a it takes it takes a, a next level of uh, for lack of a better word, filtration system that has to be developed. I mean, you're a human with a heart. That's why you're in it. You love helping people. So anybody who has a heart and loves people, and you're confronted by traumatizing situation, it's heavy. So how do you walk away from a full day of that and filter through it and make sure that you aren't, it's not hanging on to you? I think that can be done, but until you figure out how to do it, I think you're going to need to get some professional help and assistance, maybe even spend some time with people who are in the same field you are, and they feel like, you know what, I at those heavy days, here's how I recover. That'd be my first step right now. Because if you could come up with a way to be able to to handle that work and not let it burn you out, then I think reentry is going to be great. I think you'll be better than ever. If not, then you've got to go, okay, I love helping people. I've got artistic skills. Uh, you've got to ideate and spend some time going, okay, where can I use these skills that I have to do work that I enjoy, which is connecting with people? Keep it really broad. And I think you're going to find more opportunities than you, than you realized. That can actually make decent money, by the way. Uh, Will writes in, I am in mostly remote job that I love. I've been able to move around the comp- company and I've been able to grow and develop. An office building was recently opened up to support hybrid work. I've been going in a few days a week. However, my coworkers keep telling me that it is strange that I do so. Number one, who gives a crap what your coworkers say? I mean, why do you care? You, for some reason, Will, have already decided that even though in your remote job, you want to go into the office. You decided that, Will. What are your reasons? Remind yourself why you decided to do that. Then ask yourself, has it been beneficial? And if you are clear on your reasons and it has been beneficial, then tell your coworkers to go pound sand. I just, I mean, he goes on to say, it's been great to network and run into employees in my old departments. And I honestly love the routine. Great. Hey, Will. Do the routine, the rhythm that you love. Who cares what your coworkers say? And let me just say this. Well, I'm not beating up on you because I know how we're wired. We humans are wired for approval. If you don't understand that now, I want everybody to pause listening to me and watching me. And I want you to just think about the last two or three years in this country. More divided than ever. And I want you to think about what I'm about to say. Because we humans long to belong, to to be accepted, we humans would rather be in the majority or do what it takes to be in the majority than do what we believe is right. That's a fact. Now, I'm really going to hack off some of you just to prove my point. That's why millions of people went along with the nonsensical idea that you could take your mask off at the table in the restaurant and not be subject to getting the little COVIDs. <laughs> That's why millions of people went along with that. I don't want to offend the the people at the restaurant that have come up with this idea. I just, I just rather go along. Wait, wait. So you're going to act like an idiot? Okay. All right, sure. I'll wear the mask at the hostess stand. I'll wear the mask all the way to the table, uh, but then I can take it off because then I'm safe. It's just jackassery. And and, and, And that's what it is. That's just what it is. It's, hee-haw, and everybody going, okay, if that's what we're doing, that's what we're doing. Well, this is where we live. This this is the world we live in. So back to Will, now that I've sufficiently upset many of you. But you need to be challenged to think. This is why Will is writing me and he's worried that his coworkers are saying, it's weird that you go into the office. Who cares what they think? Let them stay home. It's fine. You go do you, Will. 
your life. This is the Ken Coleman Show. Where's my mask? Hey, I want you to stop and imagine your life four months from now. You got a new skill and a starting salary of more than $75,000. Now in 15 weeks, and for only $5,000, you can get the skills to land a job in front-end web development through a Bethel Tech micro-credential. And that's way less money and time that you'd spend on a traditional degree to make more dough. Listen, folks, coding skills are in high demand. So with Bethel Tech's front-end web development micro-credential or their data science micro-credential, you can move up. The next class starts April 29th, and the Bethel Tech folks offer you 10% off because you're a Ken Coleman Show listener. Go to BethelTech.net slash Ken Coleman for details. Terms and conditions do apply. Welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. If you're enjoying the show, I'd love for you to support us by liking the video uh, or following the podcast, however you're watching or listening, and then uh, give us a great review if you're on a podcast. Five stars, please. And uh, subscribe and share. That would be gratefully, gratefully received. Uh, Okay, so um, new data out that uh, many CEOs are now considering giving raises, promotions, to those who decide to come into the office. Uh, There has been a tussle for some time uh, of of major, major companies that, you know, during the pandemic, immediately sent everybody home. And and then they said, well, that's not the best way. It was the only way we could do it at the time. Now it's not the best way. We want you back in. But understand when people want you back in, even these bigger companies, it is only part-time. So newsflash to any leaders that are just hanging on for dear life. Uh, The hybrid model is going to be the predominant model. You don't have to do it. I'm not telling you to do it. I'm just letting you know, you will be leading, you will be leading companies. You are leading companies right now in the United States uh, where the hybrid model is now the dominant model. The horse is out of the barn. It, it's just, that's what it is. So whatever your rhythm is, understand you will be competing against companies who are okay with a, a, a certain chunk of remote work. So just know. So you're going to have to adapt. And by the way, again, let me make sure, doesn't mean that you've got to join the ranks of the hybrid work method, but you will have to adapt your expectations. You will have to adapt your recruiting because that's what you're competing against. Just, just telling you. So a new survey released by KPMG on this issue. A lot of frustration out there among CEOs. Nine out of 10 CEOs said they would hand out raises, promotions, better assignments to workers who decide to come to the office. So it's the carrot. They're dangling the carrot. We want you to come back in. Uh, Only 9% polled said they were neutral on rewarding employees who come into the office. And so now big tech firms like Amazon and Meta have, as you know, if you've been listening and watching this show, they have enforced return to office. It's creating all kinds of angst and people griping and I'm going to quit and I'm going to do this. Fine. I don't, I don't know, where, by the way, where we got to in this country where, where, where workers think that they can negotiate with their boss as it relates to coming into the office. I mean, you can negotiate your salary. Sure. Can, you know, but this idea of, I'm not coming back in. You can't make me. Okay, fair. They can't make you, but they can fire you. And I think we ought to have a lot of leaders who go, nope, I'm not going to be blackmailed. I'm not going to be uh, put in a false negotiation over whether or not you work the way we say we want to work. It's everybody's right to say, no, I don't want to come back in. 
but it's their right to say, great, are you resigning or am I having to fire you? Let's get clear on that next step. That's, that's also okay. Now, not in the world we live in now. Everybody feels they got a right to everything. This is what I want. This is why I want it, and I deserve it. No, you don't. You don't. You got, we, got, we got too many people walking around telling us how they deserve everything. Yeah. You know what you deserve? You deserve a good old glass of reality juice. That's what you deserve. And you've been walking around uh, thinking that you can say what you want, do what you want, demand what you want, just because you're a human and because you show some outrage that everybody has to capitulate to you. Well, last time that that actually was a normal action was when we were all toddlers. It's not normal for adults. That's what toddlers do when they don't get what they want. Adults shouldn't do that. But unfortunately, adulting is so hard. That's where we live. Uh, now, from the survey, these these leaders uh, are, are very much convinced that having people back in the office more often will drive collaboration and productivity. I agree with the more. But I would be foolish if I said that you can't be collaborative, that you cannot be productive in a remote setting. I would be foolish to say that. And that's ridiculous. In fact, when I need to write, um, I need to be alone. Now, whether that's in this office or, or at a writing space in my neighborhood or a place in my house that I'm very creative in, it would be foolish for me to say that one cannot be creative or productive by themselves. That's foolishness. However, I also think that it is true that there are times where group participation, collaboration, can create a better result that one combined with several or many can be enhanced. That's what I do believe. I do believe that. So here's the point. It's a give and it's a take. So what leaders have to realize now is, is they are in this very new world of work where people got all this flexibility, which is freedom during the pandemic. And this is juxtaposed to the fact that they were probably not in many healthy environments. They were micromanaged. I mean, one of the number one frustrations you hear from people is a micromanaging, controlling leader. It drives people nuts. Why? Because we humans have this freedom chip inside of us. You do realize this, yes? I mean, I, I, I don't think people realize this like they should. Here's how it gets positioned. Man, I'll tell you what. My micromanaging, hovering boss drives me nuts. They, The reason I'm not happy is because they micromanage me. No. The real reason that it drives you nuts is because you crave freedom. And when they micromanage you, and I understand what presents as, well, that's, but it's because you crave freedom. And when they micromanage you, they threaten your freedom. I just want to be philosophical for a moment because it's important. I'm not playing mental gymnastics. It's important for leaders then to understand what I just said. So if your micromanaging or your controlling behavior is causing tension, you've got to understand why. You go, why do they buy? Because you've, you've, you've threatened their freedom. So you want people to come back to the office? You want people to be excited to come to you? enhance their freedom. Now, how do you do that? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked me. You enhance people's freedom by number one, having them speak into the role. Hey, here's what we need to get accomplished. Here's when it needs to be accomplished. Here's how I'd like to be accomplished. Just the leader speaking. I want you to speak into that. Give them some input. Give them clear expectations. 
give them the resources. That's the training. That's the check-in, the communication. Leaders give that to them and then get out of the way. That is freedom. Freedom to fail. Freedom to try. Freedom to improve. Freedom to collaborate. Freedom to innovate. That's the key. And we don't have leaders that do that. And so we've got this corporate world that is just, everybody's afraid. Everybody's uh, controlling because it's fear that drives controlling micromanaged behavior. The leader doesn't trust. When the leader doesn't trust, the employee doesn't trust the leader. That's where all this tension is. So getting people back to the office, you're not going to do it. This To me, I... This whole thing drives me crazy. Well, we're willing to give raises. We're willing to give promotions uh, to get them back to the office. Great. It might work for some, but you can get them back in the office and you're still not addressing what I just said. They're going to leave you because what remote work represents for people is freedom that they don't have in the office. So we've, we've lost the dialogue. We've lost why remote work is so popular and, and, and leaders don't understand how to then deal with it. Make a person feel valued and free, and they'll come back in. But it's not about getting them back in. Make them feel valued. Make them feel free. Watch what there's. Watch what they'll do. Their productivity will skyrocket, and as a result, their engagement will skyrocket, and then they'll stay with you longer. Pretty simple stuff. But uh, if you ask me if I have a lot of hope that leaders will figure out what I just said, I do not. I wish I was more positive about it, but I'm positive that leaders don't know what they're doing. This is the Ken Coleman Show. Welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. Thrilled to have you with us. All right, so on this show, many times I have highlighted what I call bad bossery. It's just another way of saying horrible leadership. Um, and again, I love leaders. I, I think leadership is so vital. It's not done very well in, in the corporate world. And as a result, that's why we have such tension between the worker and the leader and a lot of uh, retention issues. It is the challenge of our day in the business world. So as a result, I have taken on Amazon many times. I'm not picking on Amazon. I love their service. Full disclosure, it's important for this segment. You understand, I like Amazon Prime. Uh, they got some good shows I like to watch. They give me nice discounts. Uh, frankly, I've sold a lot of books on Amazon. Hello. My books. Um, I don't hate Amazon. I just am an equal opportunity offender when it comes to calling injustice out in the world of work. So there's your setup. Because now I think I might be coming to the defense of Amazon. I'm not sure. So this headline the team brings to me. Amazon reportedly uses or used a secret algorithm to jack up prices. Now that sounds terrible, doesn't it? Shame on Amazon. Evil Amazon. Okay. So I dug into the story. And I really want you to comment on this. I'm up in the air right now. I think I'm defending Amazon. You tell me. Here we go. So the the accusation by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, is that Amazon deployed a secret algorithm to gauge how high it could raise prices before its competitors stopped increasing their prices as well. The algorithm was codenamed, now again, this is all alleged, Project Nessie. And the Federal Trade Commission revealed in a complaint last month that uh, they use this e-commerce algorithm and they would inflate prices and monitor whether other retailers like Target would follow suit. So pick an object that Amazon sells 
And so the accusation is they would raise the prices. This this uh, program, this algorithm would just kind of keep raising the prices while monitoring. And so let's just make it up. Let's say uh, I'm always joking around about the loofah, right? So let's say Amazon raises, keeps raising the price on a loofah, and then they're monitoring this target follow suit, right? Because that's what that's what happens. More on that in a second. That's just that's just capitalism. That's just the market. When you hear phrases like, what is the market? You know, let's let the market determine it. So that's the com- competitive nature. Amazon versus Walmart. Walmart versus Target. All online, all selling stuff. So Amazon is being accused of, well, we're just going to keep raising the prices. And then we're going to monitor what our competitors do. This is wrong? I don't know. So the FTC has accused Amazon of illegally maintaining its market dominance. <laughs> Well, wait a second. (laughs) Let's just stop for a second. This is why I hate big government. All caps. This is why. Because government bureaucrats go, wait a second. Amazon is making too much money. Now, I am all for not allowing a monopoly. That is a good government regulation. One of the few. Except that... The regulators think they can stick their nose in everything. And let me just say this. If you think Amazon has a monopoly, you've lost your ever-loving mind. They don't have a monopoly, not even close. Large market share? Sure. Monopoly? No. So the government needs to go spy on somebody else. That's my opinion. But, but this is a, you know, they've got market dominance. Who cares? Because someone's going to knock them off eventually. I said that on this show. If they keep up with their unbelievable, unbelievably bad record of burning through people, employees, Amazon will fall. By the way, for the record, if I can buy a product directly from a good company, I do so. I order different things for different companies all the time. I'm not exclusive to Amazon. So again, What's the big problem? So here's what they're saying. They're saying that it is illegal and it is wrong for Amazon to raise prices. And in this article, it at one point says it's artificially increasing prices. Again, I don't. What do you mean artificially? Well, they should raise prices because, uh, by the way, here's why companies raise prices. They raise prices because. They feel like they've got to pass on more costs. So if their employee costs go up, they want to keep that profit margin at a certain point. So they raise, I've talked about that ad nauseum, they'll raise prices. The other reason that companies raise prices is because their competitors raise prices. They went, okay, they've set the market. So let me just bring this back for a second for some common sense. Okay. In the old days, I guess they still do it, Joe, but in the old days, I could drive by a gas station. I'd see some guy out on a ladder changing one of the numbers. You know? I'll I'll take you way back just for fun. When I was in high school, I could get gas for 98 cents a gallon. I remember 98 cents. And I remember one day driving by a gas station, and the guy was up on the ladder, and he was taking the 8 down. And I'm driving. I'm like, what's he going to do there? Is it going to go to 7? Is it 6? Oh, he braised it to 9. And here's what's interesting. Half a mile down the road, Joe, it was still 98 cents. Until about five hours later when I went back out and he raised it to 99. So is that, are we wringing our hands with that move? No, what's happening? In that moment, the competitive gas station down the street from the initial gas station has the decision to make. Do I want to leave it at 98? And get more people in there going, I'll go over there for a penny worth of savings. By the way, full disclosure, that's my wife. Stacy will drive across the street to get gas for a couple cents cheaper. I will go to the closest gas station. Neither are right or wrong. I'm just saying. But that that gas station has the ability there to say, all right, we're going to keep our prices lower than the competitor. Or Or they could say, you know what? They raise it a cent. I'll take me a cent profit. And that's what usually happens. 
So what if the gas station that I talked about, the first one, sees five hours later that his competitor raised it up? To, what if he goes, all right, I'm going to jump it to 101? And so he bumps it to 101, and then he's, he's paying attention. Are they going to come with me? Because if my close competitor comes with me, I still got a competitive advantage, or I have a, I'm competitive, rather, but I'm now making more money. This is the dance. This is the market. There's nothing illegal or dirty or nasty about it. At all. And so in this case, I go, really, FTC? I think it's pretty freaking smart, if you want to know what I think. I think it's brilliant. They got an algorithm going, all right, let's drive up the price a little bit, and let's go to where we think our competitors will go with us. Once they stop, then we stop. And so what they would literally do, if their competitive retailers maintained a lower price, so if they raised the price, if this algorithm would say, all right, let's raise the price, and if their competitors did, so Walmart would say, all right, we're going to charge X amount of dollars for it. If Target and Walmart don't follow suit, guess what the algorithm would do? All of you with common sense that are following along, the algorithm would drop the price back to maintain the same price as their competitor. It's brilliant. It's not illegal. It's not unethical. As usual, the FTC, as with most government agencies, when they get involved, it is nonsensical. They should not be involved. So there you go. Uh, a shocking instance where I side with Walmart. But this is because what drives me crazy is when big federal government tries to get involved and hamper the free market. Let the market decide. The market is made up of people who are selling goods and services and we the customer. And there's a beautiful dance and tension as it relates to pricing and we, the people, are powerful because we have the purchasing power. We don't need the federal government and all their idiot bureaucrats wringing their hands, trying to get involved in something that they don't need to get involved in. So good for you. Bravo, you brilliant Amazon algorithmers. Thanks for listening to The Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman.